Yeah. Sorry. All right. I'm going to go back to those. Now. It's getting a little toasty. Down here. Hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, and then <laughs> There is a sign sheet that is kind of passing around. Okay, I'm going to call eight. Okay. Good. 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 That's perfect. Yeah, that's a good place to get it started off. Hell yeah. And then it's bad decision. Yes. <laughs> We're trying to wake up in that time, so. <laughs> I'm guessing that we should start at the lesson. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, this presentation is really going to talk on metrology and um, put the context of high flow, high volume samplers into the context of all these regulations we're hearing about. Um, I'm David Book, I'm CTO of Sensors. With me is our CEO, Joe Morell, and our VP of Marketing Sales, Amanda Pitback. Now, this product here is the high flow sampler, but it's worth me mentioning straight away. It's you know, most of us want to touch the equipment, receive the equipment. Now, I'm pleased to say that um, this product's represented by two companies that uh, have the units here. Heath Consultants, I'm sure is there from Heath, who you can go to his booth, but it's also been um, uh, shown by Montrose as well. So, available through both of those companies. So, it's a high volume sampler. Um, who used a high volume sampler here? I have. The old one. Just the old backup. Yeah. Backup. Back back yeah. back back? yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's really good because I'm going to encourage you to ask questions throughout this whole presentation. Right? Wherever I say something, you don't agree with it, disagree with it, support it, it give me feedback throughout the presentation. Okay. So let's we can try and cover these areas. I'm going to go through quite quickly. This presentation will be made available, so you don't. Need Notes on it. But really, I want to talk about us and, as a company and why I call this the Semtech platform. We come from the automotive market. We do regulatory compliant equipment for emissions from the automotive sector. So, you know, when you know about diesel games, right? They use our equipment to find performance of vehicles that are failing to be compliant, right? So, US EPA stuff. So we decided, well, OK, that's really good, interesting market. We're going to play exactly that technology into the oil and gas market. 
for quantifications to come from a regulatory perspective. And Semtech stands for Sensors and Machines Technology. So it's a platform. And you'll see in this presentation, we're going to expand the offering and include more bells and whistles on the equipment, more than just a high flip sample. So I'll give you a bit about background, but I really want to talk about the regulatory and market drivers and metrology, right? I often use the language that upsets people because I'm English, right? So when I say a piece of shit sample, I mean it. Okay. Right? So low cost sensors, and you know what they do, right? You give me a headache. Okay. So we want to talk about metrology. Right. So, Semtech platform, I mentioned we might very, very quickly from all these different products that bounce on the go down the road, okay? Driving around the road, measuring emissions, uh, regulatory, laboratory levels, right? So, what happens when you design equipment that can do this? Hey, it becomes robust, right? So, when we want to high flu sample, all of this experience to make portable equipment that's robust, wakes up every morning, can go into a high flow sampler, as you see over here. And we started this project where we wanted to say, industry said, well, make a, a that's obsolete in 2015, right? When obsolete in 2015, because, why, do you know? Sensors. Yeah, didn't work very well. And people started to freeze on it. So, for um, detection of leaks, OGI camera started being used a lot more. Right? But when we wanted qualification, we had range to change, right? But we don't want any of that. So, we went to the market and we said, what does this product need to do? Okay? Anybody recognize this individual over here with the backpack? Okay. It's one of the Heath. I don't remember this. Okay. Right? But we ended up wanting to make a replacement back rack sensor. So we've been to Colorado State University, we've been evaluated, and essentially we've got a product that you can see today. Okay. But I've also been working with regulators, not just regulators in terms of the US EPA, it's California Air Resources Board, but also some of the NGOs like the ACR and, and, and other organizations in Europe to develop better regulations. So before I'm not going to too much detail, I'll just give you an overview. Okay, it's a Ghostbusters. Right? <laughs> okay. The back rack unit, which is the back that you strap on your back and you have that for use. Okay, you don't see this equipment, and I removed this in the sea for a minute. We can still use all your back rack adapters and hoses, but we also wanted a vacuum of the leaves using a vacuum system with a, a handheld system here. So, what we've done is here is we decouple the analyzer. To the flow chain, right? Which might say, why do you want to do that? Because everybody told us we need to measure very small leaks and very big leaks. Okay. So we wanted to increase the flow rate. The back of that system probably did at best six, seven, eight CFM, right? This thing runs at 35 CFM. So what does that mean? It's easier for us to capture the leaks. And actually, following this presentation, Sean's giving a presentation in the problem, Sean. 14. 14, that's what it is, right? And, and Sean's going to show a lot of application shots of using this device, right? And you might find that interesting as well. So, this is going to draw the sample, measure the flow rate, and we're going to transport the direct sample from there over to the analog. So, what's in the backpack? Okay. Advanced TDL based gas measure. That's a whole lot better than a piece of shit low cost sense. You know, okay? Right? Because we don't want any interferences. We want to measure people. Okay? We also want the bench that's so stable, we don't need to zero. We don't need to span it. You might do that just as part of your audit trail, but you won't need to do it with this device from an accuracy perspective. You'll see, and I'll show you how good this is from parts per million all the way up to 100%. What do you think? Inside here, we also have a single board computer. That's quite valuable because it gives us flexibility. We want to start adding features like GPSs and geofencing and so on, and database management. So you can do, you go back to an asset, you measure it again, you can actually interrogate uh, the database to get the results. So essentially, a simple analyzer module. The heart of, of getting the um, sample is this device here. 
where you can actually add on the normal backpack type hoses and banks. You will see those um, on display at Heath Consultants. Stand. Um, but a simple control like you have, simple handheld device. We can actually run the whole system just using the controls and LEDs. We can pre program them, they're tight, but dual color LEDs. So we can have it orange, green, red. We can say, when you start, let's go orange for 60 seconds. So the user knows when it's on a 60 second cut. All that sort of stuff in this device. Okay, what happens? Of course, it's modern these days. We actually use Wi Fi communication for any device, and we can turn the fan on. We can measure the flow rates here to low, a low fan speed, running at about 20 CFM. And the blue dots are the leak, and we're measuring the real time leak over here at some level in liters per minute. And you know, well, what's a liter per minute? I prefer to measure in birds per cubic dinosaur, right? So we can also switch your unit. And you'll see that there's a switch to go to CFN from an SI. We're selling this into Europe as well, but you know, SI units and here we want CFN, right? But you can actually output the data in different units as well. So you can say, I want my data in CFN or CO2 equivalent uh, kilograms or tons per year. Okay, well, specifications. We can change the flow rate. We can run from 18 to 36 CFM. The backpack system was about six to eight CFM. We can measure leaks all the way up to 25 CFM, but all the way down to 0 0.0005 CFM. Um, what's that mean? Okay. I asked myself that question. Why are we measuring a leak? And that's a bit like some of these leaks where you take a tube, you bubble it through water, you get one bottle every five seconds. That's how low we can measure with this device. Daily recharge and all the rest of it, as you see here. Okay, market focused improvement. Let's get rid of the sensing issues with the alternative low cost sensors. Let's reduce the interferences, let's increase the dynamic range. But let's make sure that this gives you regulatory defensible data. Okay. So as we start moving to not just quantification for sort of self governance so and we look at regulatory governance on advance, they're going to want you to defend the data. So we have to have defendable data. So I want to draw to you now a few of the standards that are coming out, and in particular the, the latest Quad OB, Quad OC uh, standard from the US EPA. I can mention also things like the carbon register. But in Quad OB, I've highlighted all the things relevant to high flow samplers in the various sections here. Linearity, interferences, accuracies, maximum leaks, and background. So we now have a performance based standard we can benchmark the device. So you can't just say, oh, we're going to need that it goes left or right when we sample a leak. We actually have to demonstrate compliance to that. So, and I will show you those in more detail. The American Carbon Registry. We heard about 10 minutes ago uh, by Malice that she's expecting to publish her, um, her All Things Well in a couple of weeks standard, right? And we've had the privilege of working with these, these, these individuals. And in their draft regulation, they talk about detection and it's not one gram per hour. Okay. And you might say, well, why is one gram per hour important? Because it actually differentiates us from everybody else. If you look at alternative systems, CSQ report, for example, they have lower detection limits of about five times. We're way underneath. Okay, so let's look at these individually and let's focus on the analyzer module first, and then we'll do the handheld sample. Okay, so analyzer module. Okay, I mentioned that we can do linearities. Everybody knows what linearity is. You saw in the quad OB, you want to do four steps. In our case, we did 30 steps, running from nearly 100% down to 10 ppm. Okay? And I just illustrate the linearity on a log log axis. Nobody plots things on log log axis to show how good it is. Then I'll just stay by. But actually, what I'm showing you is we're measuring concentrations over one, two, three, four orders of magnitude. That's why we can measure very small leaks and we can measure very large leaks. Okay, but if 
I now look at the residuals on this. Same data, but I'm not plotting it now in terms of concentration. I'm plotting it by the percentage error by point. The reading by minus the reference divided by the reference. And you can see the various gas bottles, 100 ppm gas bottle, 1000 ppm gas bottle, etc., are errors by point are less than 1% or 2%. Okay, over a range from a ppm all the way up to 100 percentages. So, do we meet 5% linearity? Kicking the box, okay? So, what about interferences? What of B mentions that we're going to have interferences of gases that are present of less than 2.5%. Do you know what happens when you take the catalytic oxidation sensor or a thermal conductivity sensor and if you calibrate it and you either have propane or hexane or you can read hundreds of percent wrong. Okay, so you can't no, you can no longer use those simple sensing technologies. So you more or less are forced to use a laser spectroscopy solution. You know, what we're doing is a tunable diode laser, and essentially we're using a scanning system, a TDL, and that also gives us another small benefit. We can measure ether as well, and that's quite useful because you can now find out the source of the link. So if you're doing landfill work versus oil and gas work. You'd know what it were. Okay, but oh, high performance. When we went, and I'm not going to, we went to MeTech, they did some testing and they said, yeah, great, TDL works as we expect, no interference. You can look at that report and you can look at the other products, including the backlog. Uh, carbon dioxide, we can have carbon dioxide anywhere from one to 10% in our natural gas ever present. Okay, we don't care at the moment. It's a good question. We measure flow by measuring velocity. We calculate and we, we can do an estimation of, uh, of density as a result. We're not currently measuring carbon dioxide. We're considering adding carbon dioxide to the suite of uh, gases that we measure. I was just wondering as far as being interfering. No, no interference at all. The reason, do, do you know, I mean, I'm going to go into TDLs how they work, but TDLs are have a laser line width that is so narrow, it picks up on one vibration, right? So you can have water here or something else there and not even see it. So it's none of those traditional things. Okay. But we are, I'm interested, we, we've been asked to add CO2, okay? And it's a, it's a good thing, it's a bit like saying, being asked later to add hydrogen as well, okay? So, so what happens? We did interference tests. And of course, we just look at ethane and um, propane, right? So in our case, let's look at ethane first. I'm, I find this colour's hard to see. Ethane is coloured green. So ethane, we inject ethane. We injected 400 ppm of ethane. It went 400 ppm. And you can see what the methane channel in blue did. Very, very little effect. And we'll calculate that out on the next chart. Over here, we introduce 2% of propane, and again, you see no effect on the interferences. So this is just validating the compliance against quad OB proposals. The, when you add and you calculate all the errors, the methane to ethane, 0.01%. The methane to ethane, 1.8%. Do you know what? I don't actually believe it's 1.8%. I actually think our reference bottle actually has contamination there. So when you buy the bottle, you don't even know that you haven't got um, a little bit of methane in this reference bottle, right? but still well within the US EPA requirements. Okay, so we produce a certificate for the like analyzer, right? And we recommend annual calibration. So gas interferences, gas linearities, right? Let's look at the handheld device. We have been measuring flow meters that go on vehicles for 20 years. They have to measure very accurately 2.5% the exhaust flow from the vehicle. 
use exactly the same technology in this unit, but we don't calibrate it at very low flow rates. And you can see here, we've calibrated it up to um, about 35 uh, CFM. And you can see our slopes one, and you can see our residuals were within one So again, very accurate over a wide dynamic range. So the handheld was there. And until regulations are published, we have our own recommendation on how often you should be auditing the performance of this device. And any manufacturer will probably say annual calibration of reality verifications. Uh, but we are asking users to do simple spam audits weekly or whatever's convenient to them in the field. You don't, you don't often need to add a method adjustment because it's a TBR. But, and and <laughs> but OV might say you need to do this more frequent not in terms of calibration. But we analyze our results, not in terms of just intercept slope, but also um, standard error and R square. So very much an automotive. Um, Time. So we've calibrated this, we've calibrated this. Now let's look at the performance of the whole system. And let's look at what our detection limits are, what noise is, and other issues associated with that. Now, ACR said one gram per hour on detection limit. Okay. So if I take a very small bottle of methane through a mass flow controller, and in real time, I'm sure I'm making multiple injections going up all the way up to 0 0.05 liters per minute for really, really small flows. Okay. And you can see our response. Okay. I can take that and I can put that data onto our error surface. And I'll come into more detail about this error surface in a few minutes. <laughs> um, but essentially, if I take that data and I plot it and exactly leak in, these are our, all our error surfaces. When we went to CSU, they said our low detection was 0 0.015 meters per minute, which is about 26 grams per hour. We now believe that with the funds we've made recently, we're down to 0 0.005 or 0.2 grams per hour, so five times better. Now, that's actually important for some applications. Right. We also, of course, measure much higher levels. What's our noise? They mention in quad OB that the noise that you can't make a measurement unless you've got more than two ppm difference between signal and noise. So if I take that data we used earlier and I do a standard deviation, we're at 0.2 ppm. So we are clearly measuring down to the resolution sub ppm, which is about. Okay, so we're going through all of these, ticking all these boxes. Um, this is interesting. Put OB states that we need 30% excess flow by the device. So that's why I'm mean, limited to 25 CFM. And repeatability needs to be one minute. Interestingly, in the regulation side, there is no clear guidance on what the accuracy of the leak test is. They said the analyzer needs to be calibrated. But don't say for the leak, it needs to be this accurate. So we've done our own accuracy statements on this. And that's not, that's a new organization, right? Just notice that. Um, but, okay, unrepeatability. So what we're proposing, if you buy a backlight device, it's 5%. The, the market is 5% full scale. So if I took 5% of full scale, in terms of doing leaks, okay? And we say our maximum leak is 70% of a thousand, which is what it, our, our total flow rate would be. Our maximum leak would be 35, error surface would be 35 liters per minute. So if I measure a leak of one liter per minute, it'd be one liter plus or minus 35 liters per minute. That doesn't make any sense, okay? So what we do is we apply an automotive type definition of leak, and that is, Accuracy defined as 5% of full scale, right? Or 15% error by point, whichever is the smaller. So that error surface at this flow rate does this. But if we operate at a lower flow rate, it comes in here. So that means we can define accuracy also as small leaks. 
But what OB says, you've got to do two repeat measurements, one minute average, and you've got, they've got to be within 10%. So I've illustrated what their repeatability statement is. It's not an accuracy statement, it's a repeatability statement. So this is what the 10% would mean by quad OB, okay? So we are significantly better just in terms of accuracy, never mind repeatability. Okay, so we don't do that many very, very large leaks with references. So here I'm trying to show you, we did some um, use a mass balance approach that allows um, 200 litres per minute divided by 30, so whatever that is in CFM, and some additional data here. We're just using mass flow controllers in order to do leaks. If we looked at some data on lower data, you can see all these points still lie within um, our defined error boundaries. We did some third party verification in Europe where they're looking again at small leaks. And in this case, they're injecting methane at leech, one litre per minute, various levels. These orange bars are the reference levels. And again, just to demonstrate compliance on all of these results. Um, I mentioned about METEC. We went to METEC. We told METEC not to calibrate the unit. Calibrated it before, we calibrated it and checked it when it came back. And over the four week study, we saw no deterioration in terms of accuracy, bang, or performance of the device. Okay, so we are very confident that we can fulfill in the real world these kind of accuracy statements. So, did we meet the specifications? And our definition of accuracy, the answer is yes. So I believe that more or less concludes what I was going to mention. But the field, the area that um, people like Sean are exploring with people is we want to add functionality to this high flow sampler. This is our high flow sampler in terms of this platform, right? An extra analyzer. You can see we're adding CO2 as an option and hydrogen as potentials onto this device. But we're also looking at making um, devices or measuring even smaller leaks or even larger leaks, okay, with the same analyst. So if you put it back into your back lab days, the back lab would sit here, right? So you wouldn't have this, we just connect a very small tube to that unit to measure small leaks, right? But then what if you want to measure a leak of 300 CFA, 500 CFA, then we can have a heart based solution. So we're looking at all of that. We also are aware that there are times when you don't just want to do a quick measurement. It may not be a steady state leak. You want to record data for a few hours, a few days. So we are also adding into the system the ability to, to uh, integrate a GPS. So we can get geo positioning information quite relevant looking at all from abandoned wells um, or going back to get documentary evidence where you are. We're looking at communications potentially up to the cloud and other power systems so we can run this um, for extended periods of time. Okay, and on the software tools, um, there'll be more data analytic, the analytical tools coming out that enable you to interrogate the database, pull out the results generate a PDF report for all this full reporting. So we're moving from simple, simple architecture to a, uh, a, a database, because when you pull out your certificate for your measurement, you have to know that the unit was in calibration, the past, pre and post, so you get all those excited. Now that, we're doing that because we know how to do it, and we do it under the regulations the automotive sector. So it's relative safety as we do on that. So a couple of application photographs. So I this stage really open up the floor for questions. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Yeah. Okay. So I mentioned Sean, you're you're gonna do lots of application examples in, in the next presentation. Yeah, like some of the examples are, you know, flow. Uh, a lot of people ask, why do I need all this flow? And historically, you know, high flow samplers have been 
you know, at a certain flow rate. Well, having that extra capture capability can really assist you on some of these emission sources because it can be difficult in the real world sometimes when you're trying to capture emissions from these unconventional areas. Um, and sometimes it requires some extra horsepower, more or less, you know, um, and, and you need that extra uh, flow. And uh, I've, I've been in a situation this yesterday, actually, where it, uh, if we didn't run the thing at max flow rate, we were we were not able to capture the rod packing fully. So that we were running that thing at like 33 CFM. You can't get close to that with you know other high flow devices. But we were able to verify and confirm by looking at an OGI camera because we were pulling from a slipstream off of the uh, rod packer bed manifold. And basically, we we're trying to make the job easier on the cell so we didn't have to have poles over the bank, you know. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's just one. You've got videos of yours. Yeah, like, yeah, I some different videos. videos. Showing the show yeah. very job of the capture of the leak and our fishing. It's all like back in the day, we did our. Uh, yes, for like, like for, per se, we did a lot of uh, marine low loss emissions testing on the tankers, where we had to use that mylar uh, covers, or, yeah, the bag. and then the bag, like a bag, yeah. So, so with this new apparatus, would, would that eliminate using that paper if it's a sometimes if it's a huge man weight or a or a huge tank on top of it? I know, so you guys are the most creative in the region. Yeah. I've ever met. I mean, you'll you be nipping down to the home depot. I mean, I've, 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 I've used the home depot bucket. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of home like, oh, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah right. To get the, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the answer is we facilitate it. We give you an adapter, you get a hose, you get a bag, but then you guys are creative. So you still cool. get something. But what Sean was saying, and what I've witnessed in, 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 in the field work I've done with this, is in many cases, you don't even need to do that. It's really efficient and, and the capture is big. You know, like you need so much, so much natural air uh, to circulate the CFM inside the, the bag and then to collect yeah. that sample. Another question is, is what? how does it affect the by one? Well, it is a device that's taking in a sample and you need to capture the entire sample. So that's where the bag either comes in handy to cancel out the wind all together. Right. You still do need to have airflow, of course, right? You know, but but uh, or if that if you have enough power, it really doesn't make that much of a difference if you're fighting the wind. Um, so I said, well, how long? I've experienced the power for you. You know, where you put it up right on directly, like touching the source, or you take it a few inches away. You know, with experiment in calm conditions versus windy conditions. It's that's all kind of this training related stuff that that you know is operator. Uh, Related, but I, I, I can't remember Senator Roy who gave a presentation on the Quay B and C. Yeah, um, he was talking about it, these regulations are making it easier for us because it's the SOP is getting written by regulators rather than you do what you think is the best practice and somebody else does something else. And I think that's important when you start looking at this from a defensibility perspective. So I think it'd be easier. And because we've got the computing power and the self maintenance, um, we will build use cases in the, in the user interface to guide you through it, right? Because one of the skills that we learned in our automotive industry is if you can de-skill the, the use of the equipment, it, it's really a valuable thing to do. So the person that's running these equipment on the day, it might be a $300,000 piece of equipment, it's the same performance as a five million dollar test laboratory, but it's being run by a person who's got who doesn't know what a gas is. He just follows the procedure. So we want to de-scale and simplify as much as possible to maintain the integrity. But when it comes to adapters, experience is everything. So what kind of interface do you have with this to see what's going on? Do you have a okay? So yeah, so. Yeah. So with Wi-Fi, we're running a, and we're running a browser interface. So there's no software, there's no IT. Um, but Sean can demonstrate it yes. on, on his books. It's got to be so we're going to have a look and play with it. But essentially, I showed you a simple chart. But you can bring it up on your iPhone. Yeah, yeah. So you, right. But well, basically, this is a screenshot. For example, it's going to be somewhere, wasn't it? Perfect. 
This was an example screenshot somewhere. There you are, at the end of the test. Gotcha. Right? So you imagine you did it before. This is your average, sure. right? Your leak rates. And, and of course, it's typical, typical web-based type interface. You can see the URL the address. The address open up. Yeah. So are you too approved? Okay. <laughs> well, you know what? That's a good question, right? Um, so I think the regulation requires any, any, I mean, the US EPA gladly type approved equipment, yeah. writes a performance based standard and says, right. you better do your own due diligence when you buy the equipment, select the right equipment because ultimately yeah. it's on you, right. right? In our PEMS business, that's the automotive, we did go to TUV to get our software approved and our equipment approved. And, you know, I would imagine in Europe, because Europe's looking at this and it's just, there might even be a same standard eventually that will get harmonized into Europe, then there might be some type of type of approval that's required. Well, similar to like, you know, opt-out camera, you know, we have, the, you know, the, the Quado A certificate for the opt-out camera, it'll do the same thing. It's an outbreed protocol that yeah. will be that piece of equipment compliance. So yes, yeah. uh, that's as simple as it is, you know, I mean, and that's in the presentation you did proves all that. Well, but it's the first time, you know, in, in everybody have brought back that thing, love it, whatever. It's the first time there's a performance-based regulation says, you got to do this interference test, you got to pass it, right? I'm not bothered if it's a black box or not. If it's a good performance-based regulation, it's, a, it's a, everybody has to pass it, right? There are settings where you require. No, it's a dance. Here, so it does work Yeah, we've got two units now in Europe. We have an office there at Dusseldorf. And so, yeah, we know we have to go through a whole series of other. Typically, in Middle East, they all, always follow the US EPA rules because they're free and online versus they're getting fine. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I don't know. I mean, I'm not expecting any, any harmonization. I'm not that optimistic at the moment. Um, and best practice will be defined a bit like what we want to mention in this quad OB will be that somebody's going to produce some data submission template and everybody's going to copy. <laughs> and there'll be different operators, especially in the non-regulated space, doing some baseline measurement protocols that they will incorporate this instrument along with you know whatever applicable instrumentation for their protocol that will get accepted by the industry. But, yeah, basis. So by default, it become but, uh, a norm. I, 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 I agree with you. And and what's going to become really important is the device has got to show no bias, yeah. be it negative or positive, because there's two communities here. The, the EPA, the, the EPA regulation side, doesn't mind a um, positive bias, right? Right. Typically in emissions, right? Because you harm yourself if you fail the right. emissions test. Um, but if you're trading carbon, you 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 clearly don't want a you you wouldn't want a positive bias, sure. right? You want a negative bias, and allow a negative bias. Negative yeah, truth. Yeah. So it's going to become complicated. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Video of the actual operation and seeing the capture. Let me know when I get back to the video. Okay, because I want to see it. Thank you, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. You needed the heads up 45 and I totally got into something.